Hello and welcome to Frankly Speaking, where we dive deep into regional headlines and speak with leading policymakers and business leaders. I am Katie Jensen. On today's show, we speak with renowned advertising executive, Sir Martin Sorrell, responsible for turning WPP into a global powerhouse before abruptly leaving in 2018. In the last few years, he's focused on building a new age ad company with S4 Capital PLC. He has big plans for the Middle East too. He joins us from his headquarters in London. So, Martin, thank you for joining us on the show. Now, the communications industry has been left in tatters due to the algorithm wonders of tech companies like Google, Twitter and Facebook or Meta. Now, you may be pushing ahead with S4 Capital as a digital advertising agency, but frankly speaking, are you trying to revive a corpse? Or in other words, with <laughs> math men delivering precise results, do clients still need the madmen? Oh, well, that's a bit of hyperbole, Katie. You didn't. You didn't tell me about that in the green room. Anyway, I think you're you're um, you're exaggerating to make a point, I guess. But look, if you look at the industry, you look at the global media industry. It's about last year was about four hundred and fifty billion dollars. Uh, there's about five hundred billion additional in marketing services, about eight hundred billion in trade budgets, and about four hundred billion in digital marketing transformation. So about 1.4, 1.5 trillion that we, in one sense, look at four addressable markets. The first one, I think, is the one you're referring to. And if I look at that 450 billion, it breaks into two pieces. <clears throat> and there's one piece that is vibrant, which is about 60% of it, which is digital. So last year, let's say about 350, 375 billion was in digital. And the balance was in traditional. Now, you, you used extreme comparisons, being torn to shreds and corpses lying around. You might be able to apply that to analog or, or the traditional. That's probably a bit harsh, but they certainly have not grown in the last few years. In the pandemic, during the last two years, they have grown as the fiscal and monetary stimulus, which is probably around 10 to 15 trillion globally out of a worldwide GDP of around 90 trillion. That has stimulated the growth, not only of digital, but analog. But last year, the other part of that digital, that 60% that I referred to before, probably grew at about 30% uh, as, as an industry and the analog part at about 10. And overall it grew at about 20. Your, your R figures for last year are gonna be released tomorrow on the on the London Stock Exchange. And they will show growth well in excess of that digital growth, well in excess of that 30%. But what you're seeing is really two, two nations, two cities, two countries. There's an analog country and there's a digital country. And the digital country is exhibiting growth. And the pandemic actually has accelerated that growth. We've seen very significant take up of digital communications at a consumer level. You know, we educate our kids, we buy our financial services, we buy our necessities online, more, more prevalently now than we did before the pandemic. So it accelerated that trend. We've seen it, seen it with the media, that, that's what you were referring to in your opening comments. Uh, the traditional media have been brought under heavy pressure and digital media, whether that be, uh, streamers, whether that be digital radio, digital outdoor, digital activities of, of any kind in the media uh, have accelerated. And then finally, thirdly, at an enterprise level, companies have been embracing digital marketing transformation very aggressively, particularly in the early stages of the pandemic around March or April of 2020, we saw very heavy take up uh, pretty immediately as GDP growth slowed uh, to take it up. So Coming back to your, your, your high, hyperbole question at the beginning, there are really two, two things we're talking about. One is a digital industry, which is vibrant, and the other is an analog industry, which is under 
uh, heavy pressure. Okay, well, let's talk about that digital focus. Now, some of your biggest clients include Meta and Google, yet you're an advertising and communications business serving the same right. companies that are destroying parts of your industry. Now, does it ever feel like you're in bed with the enemy? Again, you're being extreme. I mean, your, your program is called Frankly Speaking, and you're trying to be uh, stimulating in terms of the conversation. We work in partnership. Our biggest client, as you, you mentioned, uh, is Google. Uh, our second biggest client was part of Alphabet. Uh, our second biggest client is uh, an NDA, non-disclosed telecommunications company. You might guess who it, who it is. Our third is Meta or, or, or Facebook. Our fourth is BMW Mini. Our fifth is Mondelez. Our sixth is HP. Uh, we recently uh, joined with a, an nda FMCG company. And then beyond that, in our top 10 are companies like Amazon, Pay, PayPal, and T-Mobile. So it gives you an idea, about 50% of our revenues come from tech. We work very closely with the tech companies. I think your comment might have been true uh, a few years ago when it was seen. And I think this is a misunderstanding or miscommunication, may, may, mainly by the media industry, but also by analysts, the, the, the tech companies really don't want to invade the advertising and marketing services space. They're not inherently service businesses. They operate with much fewer uh, people and much, few, much smaller networks of people. They really rely on higher productivity per head in the tech space. So we have now about 8,500 people in 33 countries. Uh, they're operating about 70% uh, in North and South America, about 20% in EMEA, including the Middle East, of course, uh, and about 10% in the Asia Pacific. About 60% of what we do is in digital advertising content, about 30% in, in data and analytics and digital media, and 10% in tech services. So we're providing digital transformation services to complement what the big tech companies, and really there are six platforms that are really of, it, of importance on a, on a global scale. The first uh, is Alphabet and Google. The second would be Facebook uh, or Meta and Facebook and Instagram, et cetera. Uh, the, the third would be Amazon, which built its ad revenues to about 41 billion, or will do this year, last year around 30 billion. Uh, last year, Google was around 215 billion. Uh, and last year, Facebook was about 115. I think Google probably will go to about 250, 260 uh, this year. And Facebook probably, despite all the pressures that people talk about, probably go up to about 130, 135, 140. Uh, Amazon, as I said, will probably go to about 41 billion. So that's in the West. Uh, and then the East, of course, you have Alibaba, Tencent, uh, and TikTok, which is part of ByteDance. Those are the six major platforms. Beyond those, uh, obviously, Twitter gets a lot of uh, ink, particularly with Elon Musk's bid for, for Twitter, a successful bid for Twitter, or we have to see it go through. But Twitter is only generating about four billion of ad revenues, and that's being called increasingly into question by Elon Musk's move. Uh, even this morning, he was talking about charging corporates and maybe small fees, but small subscription fees for, for use of Twitter. But it's a small platform from the point of view of advertising. Snap gets a lot of ink, very successful, but again, its advertising is around 5 billion. So uh, Pinterest, even, even smaller. So the major platforms are the six that I referred to, and you have to think about them being partners. They're not displacing us. I mean, our, our uh, objective at S4 and our operating brand, Media Monks, is to create a new advertising and marketing services model because the, the old model, the analog holding company model, which dominates uh, Middle Eastern uh, advertising industry. That model was started really in about the 1950s with IPG and Marion Harper. It's been in existence for about 70 years. And we think it's time for a change, particularly in a 24 seven, always on digital world. And we have four fundamental principles driving the development of our model. The first, we're purely digital. Uh, we focus on that 60% that, that I mentioned, almost two thirds of that global media market and marketing services and trade budgets, and di digital transformation I mentioned before, we focus on that digital growth area because that's where the growth is gonna be. And it's forecast, digital is forecast to be about 75% of the market by 2025. So considerable growth this year, 
digital will probably grow despite the slowdown in global GDP by around 15 to 20%, whether you're looking at America where it will grow faster or whether you're looking at the rest of the world where it will grow at around 15%. And that's projected for the next few years. Our second fundamental principle is data driving the creation of digital advertising content being pumped out through digital media in a continuous loop, rather like an election campaign, but without an election date, we call that the Holy Trinity model. Our third fundamental principle will go to market is faster, better, cheaper. Faster means about agility, which is the key corporate attribute in a world that's moving so quickly as we've seen in the last three months. Uh, better means understanding the digital ecosystem that we touched on before, those platforms I mentioned, but not only the platforms, but the hardware and soft companies, software companies like Microsoft, like Apple, like Adobe, like Salesforce, like Oracle, understanding them uh, and, and how they function and cheaper or efficiency is about being efficient in, in a, a, particularly in a growing inflationary world. And the final fundamental principle is to have a unitary structure. One brand goes to market as media monks that is integrated. The holding companies tend to be fragmented and fractured. I was just talking to uh, somebody in India who member of a holding company, uh, a fractured holding company who was bailing out. Uh, and the reason it was bailing out is become too administrative and too difficult for them to integrate. So those are the fundamental principles that we operate in, and we operate with the tech platforms to implement and, and grow with them. Well, clearly some big changes are on the way. Let's talk a little bit about this part of the world. Now, the Middle East and Africa makes up about a fifth of your business. In an Arab News interview last year, you said that Beirut used to be the advertising hub of the Middle East, which then shifted to Dubai and is now moving to Riyadh. What do you feel is driving that change? And what is going to give Riyadh an edge in attracting the creatives and becoming the region's advertising centre? I think it's a really interesting question, particularly because of uh, some of the developments that, we, with, that we've seen recently and that are likely to continue. So I think the first thing is when you look at the world uh, and you look at the era that we've gone through in the last 50 years or so of globalization, Larry Fink has written uh, far more eloquently than I can say about uh, maybe the, the end of globalization. I don't think it's the end, but certainly the world as we knew it, as described by Professor Levitt, a famous marketing professor at the Harvard Business School in 1983, I think it was October of 1983 in the Harvard Business Review, when he said consumers are going to consume everything in the same way everywhere. That era of free trade and growth and development and high GDP growth has probably ended, at least for the time being. And we're faced with slower GDP growth where we're much more selective. Uh, and as a result of the war in Ukraine and the continued tensions that we're seeing uh, in Central and Eastern Europe and Europe as a whole, I, I think to use uh, an investment analogy that investment professionals talk about, they talk about risk on and risk off, risk on being where you increase your investment and risk off where you decrease it. So I see, uh, you know, whatever happens, whether we have a, a bad piece as they describe it in relation to Ukraine and Russia, unlikely. It's likely probably that the conflict continues uh, and tensions continue. So it would be risk off in Central and Eastern Europe. It would be probably risk on in Asia Pacific, increased investment there, maybe with some concern about what happens uh, with China and Taiwan, given what's happened with Russia uh, and Ukraine. And so maybe China people are, are going to be a little bit more cautious. Uh, my, my the, the information that I get uh, seems to suggest that the, the Chinese government, having seen what has happened uh, with Russia and Ukraine, will probably be more longer term in terms of their objectives around Taiwan. But it certainly increases levels of risk uh, in China. The rest of Asia, uh, India, Indonesia, uh, Vietnam. Cambodia, Bangladesh, the Philippines, et cetera. These are markets probably that look more attractive as a result. North and South America, I think, become very much more attractive as a result of what's happening and the, the tension. So it'd be risk on. We, particularly in Latin America, we see significant shifts already from Central and Eastern Europe in terms of nearshore and offshore activity to that, those regions. And finally, the Middle East and Africa, I think, uh, we're seeing, a because of oil prices and the rise in energy prices and the likelihood that that continues for a significant period of time, 
that means a, a very significant transfer of wealth to the Middle East. And I think uh, it, it will indicate significant growth prospects. So definitely risk on in the context of the Middle East. Africa, a little bit more nuanced. It's quite difficult uh, infrastructure issues, uh, stability issues, corruption issues in Africa probably make it more difficult to, to establish and grow operations there, but there's certainly risk on in an African context as well. So I think that's what's happening. And so the Middle East for long-term strategic reasons and for shorter term reasons, some of the, the, the issues that we've been grappling with in the last few months, particularly the war uh, in Ukraine, uh, I think drives you to think that the Middle East will become even more significant. For the traditional advertising agency, as I think that poses significant issues because with greater growth and greater investment comes greater focus and greater demand for, for openness and transparency. And the Middle East, frankly, has not been a market where there has been a great degree of transparency uh, hitherto. And I think that will increase. And I think uh, political forces are, are, are driving that. So, uh, and we will see shifts, as you, as you mentioned, your opening remarks of, uh, from Beirut, obviously to Dubai and, and now to Riyadh as well. I mean, regional centers. Well, let's talk about what, Riyadh specifically. Yeah. Now, in this interview with Arab News last year, you said you were looking at opening an office in Riyadh. It would depend on developments. Has that now happened? Because you're working with a number of big brands. You're working on Neom and Kadir at the moment. Is that regional office now in place? Yes, it is in place. And of course, um, you, you really have no choice in the matter because you will have to establish uh, a, an office in Riyadh to develop your Saudi Arabian business uh, in the region. So uh, the answer is yes, uh, on both counts. And we, we continue to expand there. Uh, and we see some very significant opportunities there. And how many of your talent in the Riyadh office are Saudi nationals? I know that in a 2020 interview with Arabian Business, you said that depending on imported expatriate talent is not the way to go. Well, it's, it's, it isn't. I mean, one has to develop national talent. But of course, given, given the pace of development that's being contemplated uh, and the very ambitious goals that the government wishes to, to achieve, it, it probably has to be done by a mixture. So the answer to your question is you're, we're doing a, a judicious, we're putting in place a judicious mixture of, of uh, talent from outside the region. Uh, and inside the region, and over time, trying to ensure that we have very strong local talent, whether it's based in Saudi, whether in the UAE, uh, or elsewhere in the region. But, you know, ultimately, in the long term, it has to be the local talent that wins through and that we develop. But in order, as I say, to get the pace of development that the, the government is demanding, you have to make sure that you, you have the talent in place, not just domestically, but from abroad too. Well, let's talk about some of the projects that you're working on with Kadia and Neom as well. What do you feel in your opinion that the world doesn't yet know about these hugely ambitious projects? Well, it, it's, you know, when one looks at the goals, I mean, they are so demanding and so ambitious that I think uh, people externally look at it and say that, that achieving them is not exactly the easiest thing in the world to do. Having said that, my, my experience is that the scale of resources uh, and the commitment is so great uh, and the quality of the resources uh, are so significant that uh, I think they will be successful uh, in the longer run. So I, I think it's a question of educating um, the world to the, the nature of the projects, the nature of the ambition, uh, the scale, obviously, uh, and the, the willingness uh, and resources that are being deployed to make, ensure that they're successful. So I think it's a question of educating people, whether you're talking about tourism, whether you're talking about development, whether you're talking about technological development, whether you're talking about infrastructure developments, whatever it is, it's really educating people uh, as to the scale of the ambition uh, and the likelihood that, of success, which I think will be very high, particularly given what we were talking about before, particularly given the fact that long term, if you look at the way the world's developing, clearly uh, the region will be, uh, will be increasingly important. And then secondly, given 
the, the somewhat regrettable political developments, it's not more than somewhat regrettable, the regrettable developments that have taken place recently and the increased insecurity in various parts of the world that uh, you're, you're seeing the region will, will if I dare I say it, benefit from that uh, and you will see increased investment in the area. Well, let's talk a little bit about WPP and the holding companies. You've been very critical of holding companies saying they need to delist and go private if they want to avoid going out of business. Do you feel, frankly speaking, it is the end of the road for media holding companies? Well, there are four, four big holding companies, uh, which I think dominate actually in a, in a, in a Middle Eastern context, uh, the market, at least currently. I don't think that will be the case in the future. Uh, and those would be IPG, that would be Omnicom. It would be, you probably have to include Dentsu in there as well as WPV and Publicis. So probably five that you that you would think about. Uh, and they dominate they dominate the region. Their, mar, the margin, their model, as I said, is a, is a model that gets, stretches back 70 years. If you look at their performance over the last four years, I mean, I left WPV four years ago and I was looking at it, interestingly, a few days ago. I mean, they're... they're stock market performance uh, has been uh, weak uh, against all the indices uh, and against other sectors. And I think the market, what the market is indicating is a concern about whether the model works. Uh, we've seen, because of the fiscal and monetary stimulus over the last couple of years, we've seen a rebound generally. You know, To some extent, uh, we've been living in a in a subsidized world in the last two years and therefore you know when the the, the tide rises all boats rise uh, and they've risen with that but if you actually look at it in terms of market performance over the last four years i mean for example the incentive plans inside wpp for the last four or five years that failed to pay out anything and the reason was they had slipped between b- below median performance even for their industry. So the performance of the companies, the market, I think, is somewhat suspicious of the structural, long-term structural performance of their models, perhaps buoyed recently by the fiscal stimulus and buoyed recently by clients whose margins have been improved by reduced T&E uh, and reduced office expenses, which expanded margins in the short term. But I, I, I think that what the stock market is signaling in relation to the holding companies is a general suspicion, a structural suspicion about their longevity. Well, is your criticism directed at WPP? Is it a personal vendetta or do you generally feel <laughs> they and some of the other big no, companies have lost no, their way? No, I think, I think ju- just look at the facts, Katie. I mean, you just look at the, the stock market performance against the indices. And in fact, it's, it's clear for all to see if you look at the performance over the last four or five years, it just uh, has not been. And uh, in terms of comparison to the S&P index or the FTSE 100 index or whatever index you, or the Japanese indices, you know, they just really haven't performed. So if you just run the numbers, you see they haven't performed uh, even at uh, average levels uh, in relation. So now that may change over time, we have to see. But going back to your, your questions about, um, you know, what's the best structure? From a personal point of view, I, I continue to be a shareholder in WVP. Uh, from a personal point of view, I think probably a, a breakup of those companies will probably be the, the 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 best response. I think you know an Ogilvy or an AKQA or a VML probably would operate better if uh, individually than as part of the group. They talk about having simplified the group. The groups don't work well together. Again, you know, talking to several people as we do frequently, uh, many people inside the organization cl- claim, you know, they claim that they've simplified their organizations. Actually, they haven't. They've made them more complicated because they're more vertically driven and the verticals don't work together to solve problems for clients or to solve or to provide solutions for clients. Do you think it's similar issues for a lot of Middle Eastern uh, media holding companies as well? Do you feel that they're under the same pressure, the same concerns for them too? Well, I, I, when you say, uh, you know, if I if I was running a, a Middle Eastern or any other media company which had analog properties, uh, the challenge is just the same challenge as we've seen for others, and that is that that the challenge remains that you have to bring it together 
uh, from a digital and traditional point of view. You know, if you start with an analog business and you try and move it into a digital business, it's extremely difficult because, you know, there are different things that are, uh, are demanded uh, in, in different areas. But if you start with a purely digital business, it's easier. Uh, because you have none of the baggage, some of the none of the baggage from before. Well, so Martin, I know we're almost out of time, but I can't let you go before hearing your thoughts on the Elon Musk acquisition of Twitter. You mentioned it at the start of the show. Now, last month you told Yahoo Finance Live that, to your mind, the purchase was more of a trophy property play, and that it will give Musk a strong voice. Why do you believe this is the case? I said that. I said actually that was one of the reasons. So the other reason could be a marketing voice. Uh, another reason could be because of the, the linkage with uh, Starlink and indeed uh, Tesla being another. Because really what he has is a, a business which, which spans data from many points of view. I mean, he, he doesn't build cars, really. He builds uh, chips on wheels. Uh, and those are data points. He has Starlink, which is the which is the, the satellite system. Uh, obviously, he is exploring space too, which, uh, which is interesting from, from that point of view. So really, he has an, an, empire, an empire where data links or, or the use of data and software links everything he does. So there are many reasons why he could have been. He, so there, 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 may, there, may, there may have been other reasons for it other than trophy properties. So do you think that his advocacy for free speech is just propaganda? What do you think that the future holds? No, for I the think, no, no I, I, I guess he believes in that. And he believes that uh, having an open platform uh, will encourage debate. Now, now, he may find that difficult from a commercial point of view. People have observed that uh, given the fact that more than half of his production comes from China, that uh, the Chinese government may not be quite as sympathetic to that. Uh, as he is. So we have to see how it plays out. Also, Martin Sorrell, the founder and executive chairman of S4 Capital PLC. Thank you very much for your time today. We appreciate it. Thank you very much.